the theme of our meeting is the knowledge economy and its future. But I intend to begin in a different place with a series of remarks about the situation of the progressives and the character of the progressive cause. Uh, and thus my intervention this afternoon will be divided into these two parts. Uh, first, the, the progressives and their disorientation and reorientation, and then the knowledge economy as the vehicle of a progressive alternative. And I hope to speak for up to 40 minutes uh, on these two steps in my argument. The progressives. Uh, in general, the progressives today in the world have no project. Uh, the world is restless bent under the yoke of a dictatorship of no alternatives, but the progressives on the whole have accepted this situation as inevitable. Their project, to the extent that they have any project, is the project of their conservative adversaries with a humanizing discount. Their intention is to put a human face on the project of their enemies. And they thus appear on the stage of history as the humanizers of the inevitable. Uh, on the whole, they propose to correct through retrospective and compensatory redistribution the inequalities generated in the established economic order. Rather than to reshape the arrangements that define the fundamental or primary distribution of advantage. On the whole, they have no approach to the supply side of the economy. And they instead develop ideas almost exclusively with respect to the demand or consumption side. Mm -hmm. Having lost faith in Marxism, they have sought refuge in a vulgar Keynesianism as the intellectual alternative. What unites these different features of the quandary of the progressives is the lack of structural vision the retreat from any attempt to remake and reimagine the fundamental economic and political institutions. The larger context is a form of ideological controversy long established in the world in which we imagine the conflict as a contest between Progressives who give priority to equality against the background of an untransformed institutional order and conservatives who give priority to freedom against the same background. Now, for the progressives, the combination of an egalitarian commitment with an institutional skepticism or agnosticism means in practice that their egalitarian profession of faith is reduced to the attempt to correct after the fact the inequalities generated in the existing form of the market economy. And such an attempt at retrospective correction is by its very nature limited in its reach. It cannot go very far without deranging the established economic arrangements and incentives to save, to invest, and to employ. All it can do is moderate at the margin 
the inequalities generated by the present order. And the conservatives, for their part, are caught in a similar confusion. They claim to prioritize freedom, but they prioritize freedom against the, the, the background of a reification of the idea of the market, identifying the abstract idea of the market with a contingent set of economic arrangements that deny economic opportunity to the vast majority of people in these societies. So what we have in the inherited pattern of ideological contest is a conflict between shallow equality and shallow freedom. If shallowness means the acceptance of the background structure, what then would be the alternative? The alternative for the left, for the progressives, cannot be deep equality if deep equality means canceling out all of the inequalities generated by free economic activity. What would that be? That would be a myth of ancient Sparta, of inequality of outcome or of circumstance. The real objective for the progressives, for the left, must be an ideal of deep freedom. Deep freedom is incompatible with an entrenched or extreme inequality. But the larger goal is not the equalization of circumstance. The larger goal is a shared bigness. And the struggle against inequality is merely subsidiary to that objective. And what is the method? The method must be structural change. Change in the background economic and political institutions. Now, in the 19th century, the liberals and the socialists alike, from John Stuart Mill to Karl Marx, shared the view that the larger aim is not the humanization of society, it is the divinization of humanity. It is the ascent of the ordinary man and woman to a higher form of life with larger capability, intensity, and scope. But their idea of a shared greatness was too narrowly formed on the model of an aristocratic conception of self-possession. Each of the factions of 19th century progressives, liberals and socialists, had a dogmatic institutional formula. Each said, adopt this system here, and we will have at the same time emancipation and economic progress. Like the liberals and socialists of the 19th century, we must recognize today the primacy of structural change over compensatory humanization. But unlike them, we can no longer believe in definitive institutional formulas and dogmas. And therefore, we have a problem without historical precedent, which is how to develop a practice of structural change without succumbing to a structural dogmatism. What then is the essential content of a progressive alternative today? There are three large projects that would define such an agenda. The first project is to democratize the market economy. The second project is to deepen democracy. And the third is to form the capable agent, the individual worker and citizen, especially through a radically transformed practice of education. The first project, democratizing the economy, the market, in turn has three main elements. 
The first element is to reshape the relation between the advanced and backward parts of the production system. To overcome the hierarchical segmentation of the economy. And this project begins in modest attempts to disseminate the advanced practice of production, but ends in radical changes, including changes in the relation between the worker and the machine. No one should be condemned to do the work that a machine can do. The second element in this programmatic alternative is to reshape the relation between labor and capital. The liberals and socialists of the 19th century all believed that dependent wage labor was a transitory and defective form of free labor and must give way in the course of time to the higher forms of free labor, self-employment, and cooperation. It was only in the second half of the 19th century that the predominance of wage labor as the form of free labor was naturalized. We must now resurrect and reinterpret that older idea. But we must begin in the immediate problem, which is to master the situation of precarious employment to which an increasing part of the labor force everywhere in the world is being condemned. And the third element in this progressive political economy is to reconstruct the relation between finance and production. In all the major market economies in the world, the production system is largely self-financed on the basis of the retained and reinvested earnings of private firms. What then is the point of all of that money in the banks and the stock markets? Most financial activity has only an episodic or oblique relation to the productive agenda of society. Finance must be enlisted in the service of production. Finance can be a good servant, but it is invariably a bad master. Now I intend in the second part of my remarks to focus on one element in this program that I have just outlined. And that element is the relation of the vanguard to the rest of the production system. Thus, the discussion of the knowledge economy and its alternative futures. And I will proceed in the following five steps. First, to characterize the knowledge economy, uh, then to deal with the enigma of its isolation, with its failure to deepen and to spread, then to describe the dilemma which increasingly is coming to the center of the worldwide debate about economic growth and development. Then in the fourth stage of my argument, to explore the requirements for the deepening and dissemination of this advanced practice of production. And finally, in the fifth step, to address the larger cultural and political conditions under which a society would be more likely to be able to satisfy these requirements. The knowledge economy we mistakenly identify with only one of its forms, <coughs> high technology industry. What is the knowledge economy? In every historical circumstance, there is a most advanced practice of production. It is not necessarily at the onset the most efficient practice, but it is the practice with the greatest potential 
to reach the frontier of productivity and to remain at it and to aspire, inspire by its fecundity, the transformation of the rest of the economy. The earlier most advanced practice of production was industrial mass production. The large scale production of standardized goods and services on the basis of relatively rigid machines and production processes through semi-skilled labor and very hierarchical and specialized relations of production. The knowledge economy at the superficial level of the technical division of labor or production engineering is characterized on one side by the reconciliation of the destandardization of products and services with production at large scale. Before, uh, mass production produced at large scale, but without destandardization, and craft production destandardized, but without scale. And now these attributes are united in the knowledge economy. On the other hand, the knowledge economy is characterized by the combination of a decentralization of initiative in the work process with the maintenance of coherence and momentum in the process of production. Think of it by analogy to a military comparison between a traditional infantry brigade organized on the basis of command and control and a guerrilla operation or a special force that can disassemble and reassemble in the field without losing its coherence and momentum. These superficial characteristics, however, are only the outward expression of a deeper potential. The potential is concealed to us because the knowledge economy today exists only in a quarantined form. And insofar as it has failed to spread, it has also failed to deepen. A practice of production reveals its true character and potential only as it spreads across many parts of the production system. The first deeper characteristic is the promise to loosen or even reverse what has up to now been the most constant and universal constraint in economic life. The so-called law of diminishing marginal returns that when we commit a new input to the process of production, holding the other inputs constant, the return to the increasing input initially rises, then stabilizes, and finally falls. Now, what is the deep basis of this law of diminishing marginal returns? It is that the innovations that drive the growth of productivity are external to the process of production, imported from the evolution of technology and of science, and are discontinuous or episodic. In the knowledge economy, we have the promise that the, innovate, the practice of innovation will become internal to the process of production and will become continuous or perpetual. And insofar as innovation becomes perpetual, because production comes to share in the character of the growth of knowledge, rather than in the processes of transformation in nature, there is the possibility that the constraint of diminishing marginal returns will be lifted or even reversed. The second deeper characteristic of the knowledge economy in its potential is the approximation between production and imagination. 
the process of production comes to resemble the process of scientific discovery. And that the limit, the relation between the worker and the machine is radically transformed. In Adam Smith's pin factory, or in Henry Ford's assembly line, the worker worked as if he were one of his machines, with repetitious movements, reflecting the movements of the rigid machine. But now we have a different idea. Everything that we have learned how to repeat, we can express in a formula or an algorithm, and everything that we can express formulaically or algorithmically, we can embody in a physical device, the machine. The point of the machine is to do for us everything that we have learned how to repeat, so that we can preserve our supreme resource, our time, for the not yet repeatable. And then the combination of the machine and the anti-machine, the anti-machine is the worker, the human being becomes incomparably more powerful than the machine or the worker alone and apart. The third deeper characteristic of the knowledge economy in this potential reach is the transformation of the moral culture of production. The earlier form of advanced production, mass production, and the market order with which it was associated were based on the, the universality, the universalization of a low level of trust, a modicum of trust among strangers. What is the market economy in its traditional form? It is a simplified mode of cooperation among strangers that is impossible when there is no trust and unnecessary when there is high trust. Now the knowledge economy prospers and spreads only in circumstances in which the level of discretionary initiative allowed and demanded from all participants in the process of production increases and with it the level of reciprocal trust that is required among them. It is incompatible with the moral culture of low trust. Now I come to the second step of my argument. There is the knowledge economy. But what do we find? It is no longer limited to any one sector of production. It is not limited to high-tech manufacturing. It exists in every part of the production system. But in every part of the production system, it appears as a fringe, excluding the vast majority of firms and of workers. The consequences of this insularity of the new vanguard are formidable. The first consequence is economic stagnation, especially in the form of a slowdown in the rise of productivity. There is now in the rich North Atlantic economies a discourse that goes under the label of secular stagnation that attempts to naturalize this slowdown. As if, it, as if the contemporary technologies were inherently less transformative in their potential than the technological innovations of a hundred years ago. It's absurd. What could be more revolutionary in its potential than artificial intelligence? And how could there not be economic slowdown if the most productive practice is denied to the vast majority of workers and of businesses? There is nothing natural about the slowdown. It is directly the consequence of this insularity. The second consequence is the aggravation of economic inequality. The hierarchical segmentation of the production system becomes the driver of vast inequalities, which compensatory and retrospective redistribution in the form of progressive taxation 
and redistributive social entitlements is powerless to master. It would have to be uh, radical in its dimension to compensate for those inequalities. And long before it reached the requisite dimension, it would begin to disorganize the economy and impose an unacceptable economic cost. The great historical achievement of late 20th century European social democracy has been to achieve a high level of investment in people and their capabilities, paradoxically financed by the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption. But we should not confuse this achievement with uh, a, a form of corrective inequality capable of compensating for the hierarchical segmentation of the economy. The third consequence of this insularity of the knowledge economy is moral rather than material. It is belittlement. The vast majority of workers in these economies are condemned to what is in effect make work. And this is the true tragedy of these societies. Vast intensity of aspiration and effort, squandered, rendered sterile by the lack of instruments and of opportunities. To what are we to attribute this astonishing confinement of the most advanced practice of production? The earlier vanguard mass production was peculiarly associated with just one sector, industry. Now we have a vanguard which should be susceptible to even more universal and rapid dissemination. But the opposite happens. Instead of deepening and spreading, it remains under quarantine. The beginning of an explanation can be found in the contrast to the career of mass production. Mass production had a stereotyped repertoire of machines and of skills that formed as if a, a kit that could be readily taken from one place to another, guaranteeing uh, rapid development. This was the message of the classical development economics of the second half of the 20th century. There's a shortcut. The shortcut is industrialization. And as it was stereotyped, it also had minimal requirements. For example, requirements of education. Lip service was paid to education. But to work in a mass production factory, the worker barely needed to be educated. He needed only three things. A disposition to obey, elementary literacy and numeracy to understand basic instructions, and physical dexterity, especially in the form of hand-eye coordination. Now it's completely different because the knowledge economy really does require not just education in general, but a very particular kind of education. Whenever there is an innovation in the world, an innovation that promises economic and political power, the tendency is for this innovation to be adopted in the form that least disturbs the ruling interests and the established preconceptions. To this we can give the name the path of least resistance. And the knowledge economy in its present insular form is a characteristic example of the path of least resistance. But transformative practice and programmatic imagination exist so that there may be an alternative to the path of least resistance. Now I come to the third step in the argument. Uh, against the background of this insularity of the knowledge economy, a dilemma arises that has now come to the center of the worldwide debate about growth and development. 
The dilemma is the following. The traditional device for unconditional and rapid economic growth, which is conventional industrialization, has stopped working. It has stopped working all over the world. And an increasing number of countries are deindustrializing. It is no longer the vanguard. It is a leftover from an earlier vanguard. Or it is, if not a leftover, a sidekick, a satellite to the new advanced form of production in its insular form. The large firms that control this vanguard, its commanding heights, discover a way to transform part of the production process into routines or commodities. And this part they subcontract to businesses often in remote parts of the world with a lower wage and a lower tax take. So instead of dissemination, the opposite is happening. The elites that control this vanguard retreat into their inner sanctum and the process of production is bifurcated into the routinized and into the non-routinized parts. That's what's really happening. It stopped working. It stopped working because there's a race to the bottom for the lowest tax take, for the lowest wage, because this earlier vanguard is now just the leftover of the sidekick, and because the new vanguard can increasingly outproduce, making better and more cheaply many of the same goods and services that the earlier vanguard used to make. But what's the alternative? And this is the second horn of the dilemma. The alternative would be an inclusive, broad-based form of the new vanguard. But that alternative doesn't exist. Even in the richest economies of the world with the most educated populations. So how could it exist in the rest of the world? That's the dilemma. This dilemma cannot be broken on the first side. Declining mass production industry cannot be brought back to life. The conventional social democrats and the right-wing populists alike attempt to buy a few more years for this mass production with no future. The only way in which the dilemma can be broken is on the second side by making the seemingly inaccessible alternative accessible, breaking it up into steps or into pieces so that it comes into the realm of the adjacent possible. And that then introduces me into the fourth step of my argument, which is the exploration of the requirements for an inclusive form of the knowledge economy. There are three sets of requirements. The educational or cognitive requirements, the social or moral requirements, and the legal and institutional requirements. And I now say a few words about each. First, the educational and cognitive requirements. So here is a practice of production that really does require education of a very particular kind. And it requires that not just an elite, but the whole labor force be introduced to this style of education, both as general education and as technical or vocational training. This education must have four attributes. First, it must privilege the analytic and synthetic capabilities of the mind over the mastery of information. But second, because these capabilities cannot be acquired in a vacuum of content, but only in dealing with content, what matters with respect to content is not superficial encyclopedic coverage, but selective depth, a form of education organized around themes or projects. Third, its social basis must be cooperative. Cooperation among students, among teachers, among schools. The cooperative practices 
characteristic of advanced scientific research. Rather than the combination of individualism and authoritarianism that continues to characterize classrooms all over the world. And fourth, it must be a style of education that is dialectical. No subject must be taught once. Every subject must be taught at least twice from contrasting points of view, the only way to liberate the mind. In opposition to the orthodoxies of the university culture, the orthodoxies of the university culture are based on a forced marriage between method and subject matter. For example, economics is not the study of the economy. It's the study of a particular method pioneered by the marginalist theoreticians at the end of the 19th century. The life sciences are taught by a historical method and fundamental physics by an anti-historical method. But why? since we discovered in the 1920s that the, that the universe is historical and therefore historical in all of its parts. The national curriculums in the world are infantilizations of these orthodoxies of the university culture. And they emasculate the young and deliver them to the higher stages of education, prepared and defenseless for a life of intellectual servility. What we therefore need is a form of basic education that is deeper and more radical than the university education and that early immunizes the young against what awaits them in the university. <laughs> uh, now, the second set of requirements are the moral and social requirements because I said before, the knowledge economy thrives against the background of a revolutionary change in the moral culture of production. It requires a heightening of trust, of discretionary autonomy, and a strengthening of the disposition and of the ability to cooperate. Are we to take this cooperative faculty as simply a given, a blind fate about which we can do nothing? It can be an object of deliberate collective and governmental action by the cumulative effect of many initiatives, the cooperative character of education, the organization of civil society outside the state to partner with the state, not for profit through cooperatives in the experimental and competitive provision of public services, and the implementation of a principle in all of these societies that every able-bodied adult should have at least two positions in society, a position in the production system and a responsibility to help take care of other people outside the boundaries of family selfishness. Money is an inadequate social cement. The European societies and conventional social democracy in general depended on transfers organized by the state against the background of ethnic and cultural homogeneity. As this homogeneity is eroded, the inadequacy of money as a basis of social cohesion becomes manifest. The only adequate basis of social cohesion is direct engagement with other people. People doing things together in many different domains of social life. The third set of requirements are the legal and institutional requirements. The premise is that a market economy has no single natural and necessary form. A market economy should not be fastened to a single dogmatic version of itself. We should be able to experiment with the forms of economic decentralization so that more people can have more access to more markets in more ways. We can imagine a trajectory. At the first stage of this trajectory, the object is to increase access to advanced practice, advanced knowledge, advanced technology, credit and markets. 
not to choose particular sectors or lines of production, but to uplift. Now we have many models in historical experience for this. Take the example of the organization of entrepreneurial family-scale agriculture in countries like the United States in the first half of the 19th century. Uh, at that time, conservatives and Marxists alike believed that agrarian concentration was inevitable. The Americans rejected this path. They distributed the public lands on the agrarian frontier. And they organized what in a contemporary vocabulary we would describe as decentralized strategic coordination between the government and the family producers and cooperative competition among the family producers. It wasn't just the land-grant colleges or the system of agricultural uh, insurance and food stockpiles and price supports to safeguard agriculture against the combination of physical risk and economic risk. It was bringing the, the, the potential of science down to the ground to the small-scale producer through agricultural extension. And now we would need the 21st century equivalent to this practice of agricultural extension, this uplift in every part of the economy to increase the range of firms that participate in the vanguard. Then we could imagine that from this early stage, beginning small, we would begin to develop the institutional architecture of a different kind of market economy on the vertical axis in the relations between government and firms, a form of strategic partnership between the government and the firm that would be decentralized, pluralistic, participatory, and experimental. We would repudiate the need to choose between the American model of arm's length regulation of business by government and the Northeast Asian model of formulation of unitary trade and industrial policy imposed top-down by the bureaucratic apparatus of the state. And on the horizontal axis, in the relations among the small-scale producers, cooperative competition. They would compete against one another and at the same time pool resources achieving economies of scale. And then we would come to the third stage, the most radical stage, in which we would begin to diversify legally and institutionally the forms of access to the productive resources of society. The unified property right invented in the 19th century would cease to be the only form. It has an advantage in certain domains. It allows an entrepreneur to undertake at his own risk something in which no one else believes. But in other domains, we would experiment with other forms of decentralization. At the limit, we can imagine that the state would uh, hold in trust uh, the, a large part of the productive capital of society, and there would be a permanent ongoing capital auction in which whoever could assure society of the highest rate of return for those productive resources would get to use them conditionally and temporarily. There is no reason why we should crucify the market economy on, a sing on the cross of this uh, legal dogma of a single form of economic decentralization. Uh, uh, now I come to the fifth step of my argument and ask, under what conditions are we more or less likely to be able to satisfy these three sets of requirements? There are basically two sets of conditions, cultural and political. The cultural condition is the radicalization of an experimentalist impulse in every department of social life. And that, too, can be the object of deliberate action by the state and by society. 
the dialectical character of education. And the organization by the state of opportunities for every able-bodied adult to redirect his life, to change careers in the middle, to reinvent himself so that we have a society of experimentalists rather than of people who feel imprisoned within the carapace, the mummy that has begun to form around them. And the political condition is a high energy democracy. A high energy democracy that allows society to master its structure, that weakens the dependence of change on crisis, and that overthrows the rule of the living by the dead. A high energy democracy requires three sets of innovations. First, innovations that raise the temperature of politics, organize popular engagement in political life, so that we don't need to choose between a cold institutional politics and a hot anti-institutional politics, so that we not have to choose between Madison and Mussolini. The second set of innovations is a, a hastening of the pace of politics, so that impasse is rapidly broken. For example, through early elections or comprehensive programmatic plebiscites. And the third set of innovations would combine facilities for decisive action by the central government with opportunities for parts of the country to diverge from the predominant solutions and create counter models of the national future. Not just in federations, but also in unitary states like the United Kingdom or uh, France, which could combine strong central action with radical devolution. Uh, now my argument is complete, and I want now, at the end, to raise two questions regarding what unifies it. First, unified methodologically. Methodologically by the concern with structural vision. And I do so in the form of introducing a characteristic conundrum in the experience of making programmatic arguments today. I propose something to you that's distant from what exists. You say that's very interesting, but it's utopian. I propose something close to what exists. You say that's feasible, but it's trivial. So everything that can be proposed in the current climate of opinion is likely to be derided as either utopian or trivial. That results from a misunderstanding of the nature of a programmatic argument. It's not about blueprints. It's about successions of steps. It's not architecture, it's music. And this false dilemma is aggravated by a problem resulting from the history of ideas. The predominant influence on the left has been Marxism, with its conception that there's a closed menu of institutional regimes that each of them is an indivisible system, and that there are laws governing the succession of these regimes. We don't need to have a project. History has one for us. If each of these systems is indivisible, then we have a binary view of politics. We either have the reformist management of a system, what prevails, or we have the fantasy of the revolutionary substitution. If the revolutionary substitution is not in the cards or too dangerous, then we turn the revolutionary idea into its opposite and use it as an alibi for the conception of a passive reformism. Real structural change in history is fragmentary, but can nevertheless be cumulative and revolutionary in its outcome if it persists in a certain direction. The second unifying theme in this discourse is the theme of the ideal. The ideal of the enhancement of agency. To create the agent who is able to act in the context, beyond the context, and against the context. The ideal of a shared bigness. Now, what unites these two themes? the theme of structural vision and the theme of the enhancement of agency is the conception of the imagination. 
The imagination is freedom in the life of the mind. And here we have in the knowledge economy, in a knowledge economy for the many, the knowledge economy that does not yet exist, a form of production that is the tangible expression of the imagination in our material life. The work of the imagination is to do the labor of crisis without crisis. Imagination, imagination to the rescue. <laughs> insular vanguardism, did everyone grasp what that meant when it got used in the talk? Be, be honest here, put up your hand if that wasn't completely clear. It's clear to everyone. No? Okay. So, so insular vanguardism here, right? So there's a vanguard, there's a way of doing things that get done in Google right now or other places. That's the kind of latest way of doing things. That, and it doesn't just involve high tech and gadgets. It's also teams that have a lot of autonomy and are, you know, maybe there's no boss and people self-organize. I don't know if you've heard of Valve Software, but famously when you come to their offices, you get given a desk with wheels because you can just decide to move teams. You can just say, hey, I'm going to go and work on a different team. All of these kind of ideas, they're part of this advanced practice of production, as you would call it, a new way of doing things that is really productive, but is confined to small areas of our economy, right? It's confined to Uber's headquarters, not to Uber's drivers. Uber's drivers don't have lots of autonomy and choice over do things. When I've even got a car with an Uber driver and they're like, I can't drive you a different way because the computer will tell me I'm, I'll get in trouble for that, right? So it's confined to a very small set of people and then the rest of the economy is, is this lacking in that. And that's what he is meaning by insular vanguardism. Google in their tower and the rest of the gates. Yeah, just while, I'm not going to come back to questions for the moment, but I just want to check in of people getting that. The second, then, is inclusive vanguardism is one when that practice would be shared with everyone. And then there's the big question is, and as, as Roberto set out in his step program, how would we get there? So if I could just make a, a yeah, comment on this, on this idea of utopianism. Yes. The two most important features of a programmatic argument are first that market direction, and second that select in a particular circumstance the initial steps by which to begin to move in that direction. Now, uh, so any, any direction can be described at points that are relatively closer or relatively further away from what exists. Uh, if we, in, in our present circumstance, we don't have a credible view of how structural change takes place, and so we fall back on a bastardized conception of political realism, which is something is realistic to the extent it is close to what exists. That's an absurd conception of, of political realism. Now, in, in, a, in an argument like this one here this afternoon, it is useful characteristically to emphasize middle points of the spectrum. That is, uh, to describe the changes that are necessary at a point which is neither very close nor very far away from what exists. Because these middle points are, uh, have, uh, are, are, are useful for clarification. They have a conceptual advantage. But in actual politics, in the language of political persuasion and transformative practice, this middle level, which I've emphasized here, is usually no good. It's no good because the changes described at that level will seem uh, too close to what exists to arouse enthusiasm, but too far away to seem feasible. And that is why in the language of practical politics, we should prefer the very close and the very remote and combine them, the practical and the prophetic. Uh, and that's then completely different from what takes place here. Now, just one further comment. The, the progressives often speak as if there were no problem about the ideas. Uh, there is only a problem of interest. When they want the ideas, the ideas will appear. So, you know, I will call the spirits, but will they come? And what actually happens is they don't come when you want them. Uh, so, uh, they, 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 the, the progressives today are often in the position 
of seeming to conceal, for tactical reasons, a plan that they in fact don't have. <laughs> because the only, way, the only way really to have a plan is to debate it, for it to live in many minds, for it to be public. Because otherwise it's just a fantasy, it's a pretext, and that's the common situation. Right, exactly. And I think it would also be useful to elucidate, you know, when we just, so maybe these terms, they'll come through, but insular vanguardism, it's like, there's a few firms, we know it, we see it today, that ma often massively wealthy, but also basically control a lot of the knowledge, if you like. Whether well, it's they, not just big firms, because this small. insular vanguard has also little startups in it. Exactly. But, but it's a micro world, a micro. which ex excludes, locks out, the vast preponderance of businesses and workers. They're on the outside. And, and, you, and you also, which might also bring it to the country, you, we talked earlier before this, com before this afternoon, but about the example of putting out, I mean, also what you gave the example of, it's like you can think of Apple and its headquarters, 100,000 people who are basically, you know, have the knowledge, and then a million or millions of workers who are basically, you know, subcontractors with precarious work in China or whatever yeah. producing it. How, and that, this analogy with the 19th century of piece work and yes. putting out. And I'd like you to both put that analogy, because I think it would concretize it in the yes. mind of the audience, and also what we are practically going to do to transform that. So it's true that one of the several phenomena that accompany this confined form of the knowledge economy is the growth of precarious employment. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the form of the organization of labor and the representation of labor that prevailed in the world between the middle of the 19th century and the middle of the 20th uh, is the organization of a stable labor force assembled in large productive units under the aegis of big businesses. Uh, but remember that that way of organizing production was preceded in the West by several centuries in which labor and production were organized on the basis of decentralized contractual arrangements. Like the putting out system described by Karl Marx in the early chapters of Das Kapital. So the capitalist gives the material and the machines, like the sewing machine, to the worker who works at home with his family and friends. That's the putting out system. Now what we have in the world is the reappearance of a new putting out system on a global basis associated with precarious employment. And what we think of as the natural form of the organization of labor may turn out to be a relatively brief interlude between these two, between two long periods in which labor was primarily organized on the basis of decentralized contractual arrangements. So then we have a task. We can't decree the abolition of these new realities in relation right. to production. But neither can we accept, as the neoliberals want, that the indispensable flexibility will serve as a pretext for radical economic insecurity right. and for a depression of the returns to labor. Therefore, we must create, alongside the traditional labor law, a new body of rules for this new economic reality. And, and, and you can imagine, for example, a sliding scale. They, these workers must be represented and organized. And to the extent that they are not represented and organized, there must be direct legal intervention in the work relation. Uh, and here's an example of what the content of such an intervention would be. A principle of price neutrality, in which you would say, the labor performed under conditions of temporary employment must be remunerated at at least the level of the equivalent labor rendered in conditions of stable employment. And we will not allow flexibility to serve as a pretext for the depression of the wage and for radical insecurity. And we must for economic as well as social reasons because the cheapening of labor is radically incompatible with a dynamic of increase of productivity as we know from economic history. So, the, so this argument about the deepening and diffusion of the market economy must go together with a whole range of political and economic ideas. And this is my concern, that on the whole, the left, the progressives, 
have no approach to the supply side of the economy, which they abandon to their conservative adversaries. And this vulgar Keynesianism yeah. is the intellectual instrument of their surrender. Absolutely. So just and to make so to make that really concrete in two terms. So one is think of a very concrete, two very concrete examples. If you're in the audience, that you could latch onto. So one would be in the UK would be delivery drivers or Uber drivers to come to the first point. And the second would be what to do about tech platform monopolists like Google or Facebook. So to illustrate both this point, one is on the delivery case would be to sense the kind of mark fundamentalism is it's it's deplorable, it's sad, but that's life. You know, or the more extreme person, all those people assembling iPhones in the factory in China who essentially have precarious labor relations. They're not employed, they don't have any stable agreement. That's just life, right? That, we resign ourselves to that, right? That's just the way it goes in the market economy today. And what we're saying is no, there are many alternative structures we could have. There are different society scales. We could say that delivery drivers must be represented in a union. They must have some capacity to bargain. Or even at the end that he said is price neutrality. Their wage should be set. They can have that labor relation. We don't want to go back to some version of mass production, still stable employment. But they should have a self-employment setup that guarantees them a wage at a level similar um, to the other. The second point is in tech, tech monopolists is that we kind of, if we're kind of in the Keynesian or the demand side, it's like we're going to kind of go into antitrust or reform price system rather than going to the source of the supply side. I mean, the fundamental point here as well is that most people bemoaning the tech monopolies today worry about maybe privacy or control. What about the stranglehold they have on innovation? Why should Google or a few companies have a control of basically the greatest potential innovation of our time in AI? I mean, it's just ludicrous, right? If you are actually interested in, in, in productivity in our economy. That is one of the single greatest restraints right now. Why should it be confined? Why should we have th hundreds or thousands of Uber drivers who have no access to the technology that they depend on to run their business and not able to innovate <coughs> on it? So just to make it very concrete, that what we see on the left is this kind of tiny, like there's this gaping wound and we kind of put elastoplasts on it. You know, it, it, we don't go to the source of the infection on the left. It's like, let's tinker by doing a bit more redistribution. We won't actually change the relationship uh, delivery drivers have or Uber drivers have or give them access to the, the technology that they could use. Instead, we'll do a little bit more of um, fixing unemployment insurance. That is the source of what's going on. That's it, if I've kind of managed to take it on. Now, there are a series of other debates which we might have or not, depending on people's interests such as about nationalism. Yeah, let's talk about and nationalism. And so forth. Let's talk about that. I wanted to talk about that too. <laughs> well, are you asking me a question? I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> so, so, so one question is, how does this relate, some of this relate um, to nationalism and to the question of Brexit? Another, yeah. So, um, uh, nationalism. So, um, uh, what is the deep basis for the division of humanity into nation states, into states and, and nations. The deep basis is the conviction that humanity can develop its powers and possibilities only by developing them in different directions. There's no natural or neutral social order. Uh, however, the national difference in the world appears on a spectrum. So at one pole of the spectrum, a nation is a kind of tribe based on homogeneity, a principle of common descent yeah. and sameness, ethnic, cultural. It's like a family of families. Uh, and at the other pole of the spectrum, the nation would be a project, an experiment in humanity, which a form of, of life renouncing the idea of a neutral order, because there is no neutral order. But each of these experiments should be open, full of contradiction, and above all, corrigible. But what happens in the path from one pole of the spectrum to the other is something surprising, which is the following. And a misunderstood fe feature of contemporary nationalism. Uh, so. To be an ancient Roman was to live according to the customs of the ancient Romans. In other words, the collective identity was tangible. 
And if it's tangible, it's porous and subject to compromise. It doesn't have crystalline boundaries. What happens in the age of world history is that these tangible collective, collective identities are emptied out because the nations are all entangled with one another in the process of worldwide economic and ideological emulation. And they are pillaging one another and imitating one another. Yeah. So a nation has to tear out part of itself and adopt arrangements imported from somewhere else in order to flourish. And so the actual differences are diminishing in the world. But the desire for difference is being aroused and inflamed. So two nations live side by side, and they hate each other, not because they are alike, not because they are different, right. but because they are becoming alike, and they want to be different. So the, the actual difference is subject to compromise. The abstract will to difference is the object of an intransigent faith because it has no content that can be compromised. Now, and this is the poisonous character of contemporary nationalism, which is misunderstood in the world. And there are two responses to it. One response is of liberal cosmopolitanism. Suppress the will to difference. The alternative response is the response of radical democracy. Equip the will to difference. They want to be different, allow them to be different. Give them the economic and political instruments to develop real difference. Difference is not the problem, difference is the solution. And uh, allow them to become different by an, creating an experimental economy, a high intensity democracy, re creating this education, that, that, in, that recognizes in every child a tongue-tied prophet. Uh, that's the alternative response. And, and this, is, this is what we would need to do. And so this argument here about the alternative economic arrangements, I associate with the radical democratic response to this characteristic contemporary conundrum about nationalism. I want more difference, not less difference. Because more difference is, is fertile. Uh, and this, the abstract will to difference is what is dangerous. This impotent rage for difference uh, in the presence of an enforced convergence. Absolutely. And how does that relate to contemporary situation, for example? Of whom? Of well, for example, right now with Brexit. <laughs> so, uh, so I would say this. The, uh, the most legitimate reason, from, from my perspective as a sympathetic foreigner, for uh, Britain to leave the United European Union, uh, for the, the European Union, is to become something different that the European Union inhibits it from doing. So the, Euro the, the Union, membership in the Union, can be a crutch, a pretext, uh, a prison for enforced convergence. Now, what's a mistake is then to leave the European Union captivated by this fantasy of the tribe that certainly no longer exists and in some sense never existed, uh, as opposed to the other idea. Well, let's then create difference through this equipment, this economic and, 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 and political equipment. That argument about what's in it for Britain is related to an argument about Europe. So the European Union rests on two presuppositions. First, that it would be the instrument for organizing perpetual peace in Europe and ending the century of European wars. And second, there would be a space for organizing a form of social and economic life different from the form of the United States. Uh, and that was European social democracy. Now, now, the North Atlantic elites have, have converged to the same project, which is to combine American-style economic flexibility with European-style social protection within the framework of a barely adjusted version of the inherited institutional arrangements. And the governing elites of Europe uh, have 
organize the union according to the following uh, noxious principle, that the rules determining the forms of economic and social organization will be increasingly centralized. <laughs> uh, de jure in, Ber in Brussels and de facto in Berlin. And the definition of the educational and so social endowments of the citizens will be delegated to the national and subnational authorities. It should be exactly the opposite. That is, that the vocation of the union would be to defend the endowments and capabilities of all of its citizens, but then to give them the widest latitude for institutional experimentation. They don't believe in that. What they believe in is this technocratic anti-politics and this doctrine of enforced convergence. And I, directly against the interests of the Mediterranean and Eastern powers in Europe, which in order to force a change in the Union, would have to make common cause with the oppositional forces in the main European countries. So uh, from the standpoint of Europe and of, uh, of, Britain, uh, and of Britain, the, the, the disruption caused by Brexit could also be a beneficial event. Uh, issuing in a chain reaction of other forms of disruption to create a circumstance in which the European project could be reoriented. The people who are now in command of it are dead set against its reorientation. And it won't happen by some simple process of political continuity and persuasion. It can only happen by shock. Uh, and this is a useful shock among many. <laughs> So I'm just going to keep my eye on the time. I can see questions coming along. Just a second. I'm just going to take. I just have one more point. But Kate, you get your questions, and I'm about to come to them. So I think I just wanted to draw out there also again for the audience. I think why, what's so extraordinary just to to, to get in that is what is the one of the most things that we see and constantly talked about about the knowledge economy. I mean, I think it was one word. It would be like creativity and innovation. You know, it, that, that's one of the distinguishing features that's so great about it. When ministers come and talk about the knowledge economy, if they even said the digital economy, it's creativity and innovation, the creative industries. And of course, what we think of the, the essence of that is experimentation and diversity. You know, we don't want just one painting style, we want many. We don't, when innovators, as we know, have to try many different routes. Some of them will succeed and fail. And what I think is so powerful in that point was that that also relates to our institutional and legal arrangements. I mean, how many times when talking to me, for my part, how do we need, you know, we want to transform, for example, one of the things in the way is intellectual property policy. When we came, it's in Professor Unger's book, the Legal Institutional Arrangement. But how many times when you go and speak to people where they say, oh, but we've got these global rules and they can never be changed and et cetera, et cetera. So there's this great point, which is if we, the innovation, creativity that is the essence of the knowledge economy must also flow to our institutional arrangements. And key to that, as I think you were suggesting, is we want to be able to experiment in our institutional arrangements, but in a way that is corrigible. What, as you said, I mean, we want so to... So the same, the same thing happens with globalization. So the debate about Europe is the debate about the global order. So the global order that is being organized in the world after the Second World War is a global order characterized by what you could call institutional maximalism. I'll give you the example of the World Trade Regime as it's being organized under the WTO treaties and above all now the multilateral Bilateral. trade pacts like the Trans-Pacific or the Transatlantic proposals. They are organized on a principle of institutional maximalism. They require as a condition of engagement in the global trade regime, not just adherence to the market economy in the abstract, but adherence to a very particular version of the market economy. It's a version that, for example, wants to outlaw under the label subsidies all the forms of strategic coordination between governments and firms that the countries that are now rich used to become rich. And it wants to incorporate into the rules of world trade the odious regime of intellectual property that was developed at the end of the 19th century and that leaves many of the technological innovations of greatest importance to humanity in the control of a handful of multinational businesses. Now, what is our interest? Our interest is in an institutional minimalism. So that those who defend the alternatives, the experiments, are not required to become enemies of an open world economy. So we want the greatest degree of openness 
with a minimum restraint on these institutional experiments. We know that this institutional minimalism is possible because it characterized the immediately preceding regime of the GATT and because it characterized during centuries the development of the law merchant in Europe and throughout the world, which found ways to organize commerce among countries on the basis of radical institutional and legal divergence. So there's nothing necessary in this institutional maximalism. It's a project of these same people who are in control of the union and who get together in, 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 in Davos and who are in control of the research departments of the American, uh, of, Academy. Of, 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 of the economics departments of the American universities. So these people, these people are the enemies of humanity. And they, <laughs> and they, uh, and there, there, there needs to be an alternative. Now, how will this alternative come about? It won't come about as the gift of an enlightened cosmopolitan elite to the countries below. It will only come about if there are strong national projects below yes. that hit against the limits imposed by this global order. And then, they'll, and then the straitjacket will be broken. Yes. It will be broken by this pressure from below. And that's then related to our debate about nationalism and Brexit and so forth. The, the discussions are all connected. And they have a particular pattern. So we say, there isn't there, the, this fake debate about more or less market. The issue is which market? And the same thing about globalization. It's not more or less globalization. It's which globalization? And that's the kind of debate we need to have. Yeah. Very good. Okay, I'm going to take some questions. So first of all, this gentleman here at the back, and then this lady, uh, and then this lady, and I'll come to Danielle. So I'll just take three questions, and then we take them to the group. So first, this gentleman. Um, can I make a quick comment on, the, on your first question, which was, what did this remind me of? And a long time ago, when I was at the LSE, there was a guy called Eddie Kadori, who was a, she was a right-wing um, political theoretician who... You might want to stand up, actually. It would help us, because Beth Unger will see you. It's brilliant. Um, who, and who uh, wrote a wonderful book about nationalism. Um, yes, I mean, he, was, but he, he, he explained how, how Marx overturned Hegel. Yes. And this was, the, this was a preparation for his book, and we, we got the lecture. Yes. Much, so he was reading from his, his, his notes. And he explained how he, Marx overturned Hegel, and then he said, well, Marx was wrong, therefore Hegel should have been right. Um, what was interesting about your approach is you kind of overturned both of those kind of teleological approaches and said, you know, it's all wrong, there's no historical inevitability, I mean, I, yes. there is a slight sort of idealistic thing. And you so what's the question? The hope of man. I, I just want to do that. And this is where it gets to the point. You've, you've got this idea of the sort of wonder of human achievement and so on. I mean, what I like about what you're doing is that it's stepwise. It, it's reminding me of Mrs. Merkel, who I think you probably don't share otherwise <laughs> um, much sympathy, but this whole Schrittweiser uh -huh. approach. You, know, you can get there if you go step by step. My issue is... Um, that on the one hand, you say that the only way you can stop the... Earlier on, you said we've got now make work, and then it echoed for me, peace work, and then you mentioned peace work. How do you solve the precariousness of, of labor now? So there needs to be some kind of, whether it's minimum wage or minimum amount for, for work, comparability, which involves kind of rules. So on the one hand, you've got to have some kind of coordination, and it needs to be within, between states, not just within states. So that if you have all this competition, you still have to have this cooperation. Otherwise, people will go to the cheapest slow-wage cost country. But the key problem I have with what you're saying, and, and you're talking about the democratization of artificial intelligence, which for me sounded more like the democratization of human intelligence, the way in terms of educating people with the skills they need. But the problem is, you know, this evil system of intellectual property that was there at the ninth centuries. How do you incentivize people to develop the next Google, the next Uber, the next Deliveroo, but democratize it, not allow people to capture the economic benefits, allow it to be experimented with. From a practical point of view, you know, I, I go on Uber, but like, this is a driver who's taken the Uber technology and he's got his own business. How do I know he's not a racist? You know, at least I have some, some <laughs> safety with Uber. How do I have some, there's some safe security with Uber. You know, they're supposed to be checked and trapped and all the rest of it. But the, the fundamental economic issue is, how do you, how can you allow basically open source technology and pay people and pay people and, and 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 encourage me to be the next 
Guy who developed. Yeah, we, we have to discuss we'll, the details. Yeah, and so, you, there's also a book over there with a the detailed answer yeah. to that, The Over Revolution. Right. I'll come right. back to that. Well, we'll, we'll come back to that. I'm going to take the second question right. as well as that one. So, the, the key question, if I just got it there, was what you had a question which was how do we pay people, and what was the first part of the question? Precarious and precarious. Yes, it was. Got it. And this lady? Yeah. Um, okay, Now, what do you mean by the exploitation of those resources? Um, getting oil out of the ground. Uh -huh. and do you want to answer that question first? And we'll, come? well uh, the, the solution is not to impose limits on growth. The solution is to grow faster. What? So oil, <laughs> oil, oil, oil is a depleting asset. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, we know that for all the uh, economic activity that's possible on Earth, there is, in principle, an unlimited source of energy that we're not yet able to tap efficiently, which is the energy of the sun. Uh, and so, they, 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 these aren't real. Pro they, these aren't permanent problems. These these are problems that have to do just with the rapidity of our scientific and technological advance. But uh, as as insuperable problems, they're just fake. They're not real problems. And yes. So, but, but you asked another question about to what end all of yes. this innovation and growth. I think I'd answer that first. determines how you're using the natural resources. Well, but put to aside the question about natural resources and take the more general question about the end. So there were thinkers like both Marx and Keynes who announced <laughs> that uh, scarcity was about to come to an end in the next historical period, I believe they were mistaken. Scarcity is not to about, about to come to an end, and it is recreated in ever new forms. But they also thought that work or production by its very nature are a, a, a hateful instrumental burden from which we will free ourselves so that we can devote ourselves to private sublimities. And I don't believe in that also. So I think it's not true that scarcity is going to come to an end. And it's not true that all we can aspire to is freedom from the economy. We can aspire to freedom in the economy and by, by changing the character of production and of work. And that's what a large part of this debate about the knowledge economy concerns. It doesn't have to be instrumental. So we now have a situation in which this elite, this creative elite, is able to concentrate not just the gains and the power, but also the fun. And the majority of humanity is restricted to this make work. They have freedom in the economy, not just freedom from the economy, but just for them. And so the, there, there's that, that's part of what this debate about inclusion concerns. Well, I, I, don't want, I don't want to uh, empty the concept of productivity from its content by making it a metaphor for other things, like our general welfare or happiness or anything. So I would vote for keeping a coherent and restrictive concept of productivity. It, it, there is a dramatic event, which is a slowdown. I mentioned this discourse of secular stagnation. A bunch of famous American economists wrote articles in the 1990s predicting an explosion in the growth of productivity. You know that these are the same people who are now the patrons of this secular stagnation business? So, so what happened is it didn't turn out that way. So there was a one-time expansion in productivity with the uh, uh, introduction of these information and communication 
technologies and then it stopped. And then they began to rationalize or to naturalize the slowdown and to attribute it to stuff like the, the limited potential of the contemporary technology. Exactly the opposite of what they had said 15 or 20 years before. And it's a scandal that this happens in the world and that this is accepted now as science, pseudoscience. So it's, what is this? This is right-wing Hegelianism. This is, you know, the real is rational. So I, I, I will come back just because I, I will we'll happily continue at the at the end on that one. I just want to I, I, I really hear you. Um, who was the, the there was Danielle and then this lady? Yes, this lady first, and also, and then Danielle. Yeah, I uh, would like to refer to nationalism and pro uh, the notion of experimentalism that you put forward. Yes. Uh, because I really like this uh, definition of the nation as a project in humanity. But I think the term experiment and experimentalism today is mostly associated not with a national culture or a national form of politics, but with the metropole or with the university, uh, and are, which are considered quite exclusive domains where experimentalism is a viable yes. way of doing things. So what I really want to ask, who is this subject uh, of an experimental culture and an experimental politics, um, how can that subject be thought inclusively? Um, can it include the um, not so able, bodied, um, the disabled? So it's really a question of who is the subject? Yeah. The subject is the human being. Culture. So the whole argument proceeds from a conception of who we are. And the conception of who we are is that we are, we are context shaped but there's more in us than there is in the context. <coughs> and so the, the, the structures are finite in relation to us. We are infinite in relation to them. There's always more in us than there is in them. And, For instance, and, that's, and, that, and that's who we are. That, so that's our most important attribute. Mm -hmm. The most important attribute is the divine attribute of transcendence. So we repudiate Prometheanism, the pretense to omnipotence and omniscience, the denial of the inexorable flaws of the human condition. But we aspire to participation in the divine attribute of transcendence. And we think that a human being becomes more human by becoming more godlike. And we have as our ambition to die only once. Uh, and so the, the, the situation of a human being is that First, he discovers that he has to mutilate part of himself. He's not anything in particular, but he has to become something in particular to engage in society uh, and renounce many possible selves that he could be. Then he starts to grow older, and a carapace of routine and compromise begins to form <coughs> around him, a mummy in which he begins to die. And he dies by installments in this mummy, so we think. He has to break out of this mummy in order to repossess life before he dies and to die just one time. Uh, and so all of these discussions about the organization of society are related to that, to that conception of human life. How, under what conditions can we come more fully into the possession of the only thing each of us really has, which is life right now. And it's, it's, the, it's the possession of life uh, and the ability to, to, to become a mind on which nothing is lost uh, and to be fully engaged in, in, in existence while we have it. Uh, and uh, not to be in this somnambulant routine in which in order to protect ourselves against the fear of mortality, of groundlessness, of insatiability, we choose to die before the fact in little pieces, as if dying before death would be a formula to protect ourselves against death. That's what we do. Uh, and uh, uh, we don't want that because we have this other, this other conception of our, of our shared bigness. That's the prophetic element in these ideas. And I don't believe in any politics that is bereft of prophetic vision. Yeah, just, just one further point, because in, if, you, if you look at 20th century thought and the 20th century imagination of um, experimentation and experimental culture, yes. um, 
feminist movements, ecological movements, what they put at the center of experimentalism is a reworking of the boundary between life and work. And a reworking of how we envision a community of Among those who are able-bodied, those able-bodied, those who are entangled, disentangled Among in relations of care yeah. um, and interdependency. So I think what I'm, what I'm saying is that I, I am really, um, uh, well, I find your proposition immensely inspiring, but there is an element around who is the subject of this experimental movement that um, I the think real thing, the, resources. The, the real subject is the, the thing itself, the, re, the human being in the flesh, mm. the embodied, quivering uh, uh, person on the way to death. Yeah. That's the subject. Thank you. Danielle and then this lady over here. So, I mean, Danielle and then yes. this lady here. Yeah, after, after the same. Um, I have a question about the individual in the knowledge economy, so the knowledge worker. So, assuming that we take all the steps in the program, including education, where people learn to debate, I assume, and to imagine, at the end of this process, is it assumed that every individual has the same capacities for knowledge and imagination? You, what if people have different There is a variety of talents in humanity. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and this is the most resistant problem in the egalitarian ideas. So it seems to me the most promising way in which to deal with this problem is, is to have a wide and generous range of forms of recognition of human, of human excellence. So we don't have a unilinear ranking, but we imagine a great plurality of forms of, forms of expression. But I don't see that any human being who is in the possession of his faculties should be able to imagine. So this is a fundamental, so this is another premise of these arguments. The premise is a conception of the mind. So the mind has two sides. In one side, the mind is like a machine. It's modular and formulaic. But in another side, the mind is not like a machine. It's not modular, it's not formulaic. It has the power to combine everything with everything else, which we call in mathematics recursive infinity. And it has the power to transgress its own presuppositions and cast aside its own established methods and discover something that can only make sense of retrospectively. Uh, and this is the side of the mind that we call the imagination, or genius. So, you know, Schopenhauer says in the world, and as will in representation, he makes a distinction between the talented person and the genius. So he says, the talented person is a marksman who can hit a target that others cannot hit. A genius is a marksman who can hit a target that others cannot see. Genius is not a kind of super smartness. It's not facility. It's not power. It's vision. And we must think, as Democrats, that prophetic powers can be widely diffused within humanity. Humanity can be aroused to a higher experience of vision and can share in this experience of genius. This, this, is, the cent this is the central faith of democracy. And this is the basis for the alliance of democracy with experimentalism. And so a high energy democracy and a, 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 a market economy which has become open to the most advanced practice of production are more hospitable settings for the generalization of this, of, of this experience. So, I, so, so the imagination, just to conclude, the, 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 the mind has these two sides. Nothing in the physical constitution of the brain determines the relative power of these two sides of the mind. The mind is machine and the mind is imagination. The organization of society and of culture are what determine the relative power. And so in this sense, the history of politics is internal to the history of the mind. So the, the, this is one of the, 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 the deep significance or potential of this economic advance, which we trivialize 
if we understand it simply as a matter of technological gadgets rather than as a revolution in our powers, in our imaginative powers, and the penetration of material life by the imagination. Brilliant. This lady here. Oh, okay. I get very nervous when I speak, so um, I might have a bit of an adrenaline rush, so bear with me. Um, plus, I left my notes over there because I went for a pee. So, um, I'm really captivated by a couple of. I love. I, um, I love everything, and my, my I'm adrenalized because I'm excited and lots of ideas and so forth. But there are a couple of things. One is I've always thought of the um, economics as a philosophy that has brought our society in by belief, and fundamentally, it is an equation and a materialization of value, what we value and how much we value it. And so I've always been like fascinated by the idea that the economy has no purpose other than to grow and produce. And was wondering, other than the fact that one of, I feel, one of our central issues is that humans are narcissistic. We believe we are God. And I, so I love that kind of concept of broadening that picture. So shouldn't, in your um, thinking be more explicit in the way that we should think of ourselves in service not to each other but uh, in terms of the ecosystem and isn't there an overproduction we've got too much shit in the world and we don't know how to you know fundamentally we've overproduced because our economy is based on eating itself and so like when you talk about regenerative systems like the sun i think that is wonderful but i do believe like nature has a resting period and so I feel like that I feel like there is a philosophical aspect of it that is is not being answered to me. And also, isn't there a bit about decolonialization, like instead of utopian um, versus, um, I suppose, reality, how, which I don't believe in either, um, quite frankly, um, uh, <laughs> at all. Um, so, but there is an aspect of our economy has been built on. Um, a very Western driven male white perspective and we're still kind of and there, there are different cultures that haven't been colonialized still today on this earth why I visited them um, it, it might work, that we need to draw upon to look at how to could be to climb out of the, the limitations of our own imagination Don't want to ask that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the so, value. Like, so, so the economy the economy is about what we value and it's based simply on growth. That was the question. Yeah. The, economy, the economy has no purposes. Yeah, exactly. has no so pur we, yeah. we have purposes. Yeah. And so that we we have purposes that are both material and not material. But don't we I will not I will not accompany those who here or in Europe especially uh, have adopted this idea of limitations on growth, on innovation. Uh, like as a, this is a characteristic quality of first world environmentalism. History has disappointed us, so we will now seek refuge in nature as a great garden for a kind of post-structural, post-ideological politics where we will console ourselves for the bitter disappointments of historical experience. So to me, to me the, the, the debates that we, have, that we have about sustainable development are not a, 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 an exemption from the old ideological and structural conflicts. They're a provocation to return to them and invent them in a new form. Uh, and so it's the continuation of real politics in a real world and not some kind of post-historical period. But do you think that's post-historical or are we just ignoring nature as, as having no. its own form and intelligence that can be reflected in the way that we with our value in our economy? Is there nothing to glean from the way that nature produces and regenerates and is abundant that could be mirrored in an economic system or an equation? Don't, don't, I will not join you in the, in the veneration of nature. Uh. Nature has decreed my annihilation. Aren't you from so I have. Uh, I have uh, aren't we from nature? No. Aren't you the very. <laughs> <laughs> we got that one. <laughs>
<laughs> so one, one second. One thing I just got to tell you, Roberto, was yeah. your answer would say, are you happy to continue for another 10 minutes or to take questions? I, I think we can talk informally. Yeah, we, we have to continue in this. Yeah. In this study. Do you want to take any more questions? I know you're, t you're happy to take one or two more. Okay, just this, this lady here. I just wanted to see if you would agree or disagree with two and then I, well, just because of interest, I'm a labour lawyer. I've got a book coming out next month about the UK labour market, equal pay and the gender pay gap. Yeah. I'm also the national policy officer of the Women's Equality Party. So I'm asking as a politician or political candidate as well as a theorist. And I, one of the reasons I've been in the legal profession so long is um, I like very much of thinking on critical legal studies. But you talked about deepening democracy and having high participation. So the first proposition. Um, and at the same time about freedom and allowing people to experiment in smaller ways. But in order to increase participation in democracy in the UK, I think it requires a higher degree of control from the state. That's the first proposition, would you agree? So, for example, a change in the voting system. A change in? The voting system that we have. And the second proposition is other um, women have talked about unpaid labour, caring labour, and we have quantified it in our manifesto. So I don't need to get into arguments about how we measure GDP, because we can measure that unpaid labour um, economically. But in terms of the labour market and how we value different people's labour and different forms of labour, and whether those who work in precarious employment should be entitled to certain standards of labour, again, the second proposition is that too requires to reform the labour market and recognise all forms of work requires greater control from the state. So those are two propositions that I want to I think there's an ambiguity in this concept of control by the state. Well, because it, because it, it requires a new body of law. <coughs> but law is not the state. Th this is a confusion. So, so one thing is control by the state. The other thing is denouncing the idea that the market system has somehow a natural form. There's, there, there's nothing natural, that all, all the rules of property, of contract, are, cre are artifices, artifacts of the law. There's nothing natural about the market economy. It's all a legal creation, and which can take one form or another. But we, but we gain nothing by calling that control by the state. That's, that's a, that, that, well, that's an option to shape the market economy in one term or another. So this is a very important point. Which I, which I want to insist on. In the conventional discourse, it's thought that there are basically two things that we can do with the market economy. We can regulate it, or we can compensate for its inequalities after the fact by retrospective redistribution. But there's a third thing that we can do with the market economy, which is much more important than the other two. And the third thing is we can change it. It's, it's legal constitution. The, the, the terms of, of decentralized access to productive resources and opportunities. And that, that's the whole focus of my argument here, that third thing. Can you just so, answer my question in that respect on how people get paid? Well, I'm going to come back. I think this moment, I people, think we're, we're going to draw this and we can, can chat individually and bring people. Yeah. I'm sorry we didn't come to your question. I take responsibility for that for my poor chairing. What I do want to say at the end, I want to say a massive thank you to Roberto. Uh, if everyone would join me in thanking him for his. <laughs>